when you're asked the question, why do you love this person? And you don't have a good response. No, that's a it, red flag. It's for sure. <laughs> it's for right. sure. And, you know, Dr. Ramani, our, our mutual friend, who's the leading expert on narcissism, says one of the surest signs that something is up is when she asks why someone loves someone and they do not have a good answer. The, the answer uh, approximates to there's just something about them. Yeah, that's not a good answer. So and and saying there's great sex isn't a great answer either. No. Just having we just have great explosive sex. No. And there's some prerequisites for a great relationship, right? Chemistry uh -huh. is important. It's not that you can say, oh, just, you know, be with someone who's nice to you, even if you have no chemistry. That also isn't mm -hmm. going to work. Yep. So you have to have chemistry. But chemistry is a prerequisite. It's not like the thing you have to go like I'm trying to get the greatest chemistry anyone could ever have. It's just that you need chemistry. Yes. There's a moment in the book where I say, don't comparison shop for chemistry. Mm, right. Right. Instead, it, see it as a beautiful thing. If you found someone who's an incredible teammate, who's all of these things you really want, values that you uh, that are important to you, and there's chemistry, that's an amazing thing. So, Am I coming from ego or am I coming from a place of what actually makes me happy is a huge, huge, huge decision. Yeah. And sometimes we don't learn that until we have spent time with people that are less familiar to us, mm -hmm. but make us feel really good. Yeah. You know, your ego might flare up in some way or another and or you might be like oh but do i still want do i want to like do this maybe i could have someone with this or that or whatever like it, there's a lot of that in the world and it creates massive confusion instead of just going this feels unfamiliar but there's something about this that feels really good mm -hmm. i love your definition of like when you should, when you know <clears throat> that you're choosing the right person is someone who makes you feel most at home. I love that idea. And Martha, my fiance, she's always like, man, I wish I would have met you like 10 years ago. We would have had so much fun, like over these last 10, 15 years being together. And I keep saying to her, you know, I wouldn't have been ready for you because if I would have met you 10 years ago, I would have looked at you and I would have not have had the same level of, I don't know if you would call it attraction or just like, curiosity to be in a relationship because my nervous system wasn't built for you. It wasn't built to feel safe mm -hmm. and accepted for who I was. It mm -hmm. wasn't. I still needed to learn how to regulate my nervous system, heal, reflect, and, and really go through a growth period emotionally um, and physically really to feel familiar with safety. And and, 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 and feel peace, peace, and, right? and feel familiar with peace because I didn't have the familiar. I didn't understand that that was safe. No, and when you're in that, I, I think for a lot of people, especially those who are playing the field and experiencing different people and whatever, there is a kind of being single is this dopaminogenic cycle, yes. and it and it's hard to get off that cycle because you're kind of wired. You're wired for it now. You're wired for instant gratification you're wired for variety and excitement and what next and the dramas of the first few weeks of knowing someone and the romance of like just figuring each other out and all of that is like and texts and b phone buzzing and you know this and that and this person's now called and it's like a frantic sort of dopamine engine that yes. that you get stuck in and at a certain point, you have to come to value something else more mm. because otherwise, and this happens, of course, routinely, is people get locked into that cycle. And it was clear to me at a certain point, oh, this happiness doesn't lie here for me. Anxiety lies here for me. <laughs> uncertainty. Uncertainty is having an effect on, on the way I see the world or myself or this is not this is not going to serve me long term but that doesn't just because you realize that it doesn't mean that you immediately have an appreciation of what the other thing is 
or that you even know what it looks like or what package it comes in or you don't know any of those things. And so you, you know, there's a whole chapter I wrote, I wrote in this book that I'm really insanely proud of because <laughs> I think it's so on the money of what's happening for so many people. It's called Never Satisfied. Mm. And that I think is the feeling. I explain the steps of why it is we struggle to be satisfied. And the next chapter is how to rewire your brain so that you can actually rewire yourself for happiness. Because I know for a long time, I was that never satisfied in relationships person. or just yeah my love life I, I think in life too right right right, right. but in <laughs> in my love life i was just chasing 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 dopamine dopamine i'm not happy i need to get out of this relationship uh, i'm single dopamine dopamine oh, i'm not happy here i knew you know like the there must be some perfect person who's going to make me feel differently about this whole thing and i'm going to feel different when i meet that person and that person didn't come because it wasn't really about that. It was something was going on with me. I was a, I was in that cycle, and it and it. The other thing that is available to you is so. It, I don't want to. This isn't a. This isn't a lecture on whether someone should be single or in a relationship. So I. I don't want to become that person. Sure, sure. But I. What is so amazing about a healthy relationship? is not available to you until you come to value something different. It's like someone who's been used to doing drugs every day. And then the day that you, that you get them to quit drugs, mm. you sit them outside their house in front of a beautiful field <laughs> and you say, appreciate the sunset. <laughs> Yeah, there's no dopamine rush anymore. A sunset is a mate. Like uh -huh. a, a sunset is an awe-inspiring, yes. unbelievable thing. It is something that is mind-blowing. Why do we all go on holiday and everyone at the same time goes out onto the beach and watches the sunset? Because there's something stunning and magical about a sunset. But for the person who's been doing drugs every day, you, that's not the day you can appreciate no, a sunset. No. <laughs> you you are coming out of all of those feelings that you've been addicted to and all of that like instant gratification, dopamine. So it's about like, again, it's mm. nervous system stuff, right? It's retraining my nervous system. And this is some of the stuff we talk about in how to rewire your brain, but it's you have to orient yourself towards a different goal. And in the beginning, you can't expect the new thing to feel like the old thing. Because it's not, it's not going to feel like the old thing. But the more you lean into the new thing, it, you develop an appreciation for how much better it actually feels. And that's like a kind of stunning and eye-opening realization um, and I'm, I feel really passionate about this because I see a lot of really unhappy people. I was one of them, by the way, who are stuck in those cycles. And, and I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of people who get stuck in optimization cycles in their love life where it's like, especially type A people. Not everyone does, but a lot of people do where it's like, I'm trying to find the perfect thing and I'm trying to, and, and, and if someone's missing this thing, I'm going to optimize and go for another person who's like got all the good things about this person, but, and also that thing. And it's like, people don't work like that. You exchange one basket, basket of ingredients for another basket of ingredients and you'll get new good stuff and new bad stuff and challenging stuff. And it, you, I'm I'm a huge believer. I think the um, settling is a word that has has a really unfairly negative connotation, and it shouldn't. Is something amazing about that word? It, you can change the meaning of of that depending on the word that goes after it. So if you say, if you tell someone you have to settle for something, that feels immediately negative. Right, I it's like settling if, down. Yeah, because I f I feel like I'm being shortchanged. Uh -huh. But if you say settling on something, mm. that changes it because you, Lewis, settled on a particular business 
and brand. Mm, yes. You, you're such a capable person. You could have done a hundred different things in this lifetime and you would have been a success at them. Right. So how the hell do you decide which one you should do? You found one that scratched the itch in a bunch of different ways. It allowed you to be creative. It allowed you to broadcast, which is something you're really good at. It allowed you to connect, which is something you're really good at. Mm -hmm. It allowed you to, you know, harness all of these relationships, which is something you're really great at is relationships. It allowed you to put to work your strategy mind. It allowed you to be competitive, which is something that's in your bones. And, and so it, this business, it ticked a lot of boxes for yeah. you. But it's not the only business that would have ticked boxes sure, for you. Sure. There, there are other things you could have done that would have ticked boxes. But you settled on greatness. Yes. And you said, I'm going to go all in on this and I'm going to keep going on this. And the thing that has made what you do so great and what you have done is extraordinary. What you've built, the, the audience you've built, the platforms you've built, the body of work you've built is extraordinary. But it's not extraordinary because you found an extraordinary thing. You didn't find the word greatness. And <laughs> and like, you know, you just went, I've got the... If you'd have said to me like 15 years ago, we didn't know each other then. But when you started, if you'd have said to me, Matt, I've got the greatest idea. Mm -hmm. I am going to take the word greatness and I am going to just own that world and, a word and build a brand out of it and do all of the i would have been like that's not an idea right. <laughs> like, <laughs> right, right, right. so you've taken a common word in the english language yeah, yeah. you talk uh, about it yeah yeah you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah. but that's not what's made this extraordinary mm. what's made this extraordinary is that you have settled on it mm. and you keep you take this thing to another level every year 